master's degree in physiology, biomechanics, and human nutrition. I've spent the past two decades competing in some of the most masochistic events on the planet, from seal fit Kokoro, Spartan Agoji, and the world's toughest mutter, to 13 Ironman triathlons, brutal bow hunts, adventure races, spearfishing, plant foraging, free diving, bodybuilding, and beyond. I combine this intense time in the trenches with a blend of ancestral wisdom and modern science, search the globe for the world's top experts in performance, fat loss, recovery, hormones, brain, beauty, and brawn to deliver you this podcast. Everything you need to know to live an adventurous, joyful, and fulfilling life. My name is Ben Greenfield. Enjoy the ride. Hey, the Super Ultra Special Podcast episode you're about to hear is the first of a two-part series that I recorded when I was in Lexington, Kentucky, lecturing at a wonderful Precision Medicine Conference down there. Not only did I get a chance to get on stage and talk about all the different blood and biomarker tests you should get, how to interpret them, how to line up your reference ranges, what tests are worth your time, what tests aren't worth your time, uh, and I gave that lecture, which I'm going to give to you today. Uh, but I also gave a follow-up uh, Q&A, like a 90-minute Q&A on all this stuff with about four other uh, physicians on a panel with me. So we're going to take a deep dive into precision medicine the next couple episodes. It's cool stuff. Uh, and um, the show notes for this episode are going to be at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Kentucky. And then what I'll do is I'll put the show notes for the, the follow-up episode that comes after this over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Kentucky number two. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Kentucky and bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Kentucky too. Okay. Um, maybe I drank too much bourbon before this show. This show is brought to you by Keon, where we blend ancient wisdom and modern science to create pure and efficacious shotgun formulations of supplements and functional foods such as our wonderful, tasty, addictively good energy bar. Uh, this is an energy bar with no artificial nasties in it. It's cocoa nibs and coconut flakes and almond and grass-fed gelatin and cocoa butter and sea salt. It tastes like this bite of coconut chocolate-illy. Chocolate-illy? Chocolatey? Chocolate. Coconutty. Mind-blowing. Explosion of flavor like chocolate coconut ice cream, except in a bar can actually freeze this stuff and put it on ice cream. That's my dirty little secret. Uh, anyways, you can get this along with any of our other fantastic, fantastic things at Keon uh, at a 10% discount. Very simple. You go to getkeon.com. That's getkion.com. And the discount code that you can use over there is very simple. It's BGF10. BGF10 at getkeon.com. Com. This podcast is also brought to you by the wonderful flavor wizards at Organifi. They make vegetable powders and red juice powders and, yes, even gold powders at Organifi. They have this gold chocolate one. It's basically like a kind of like the golden milk latte you get at Starbucks with a boost of cacao in it. But they throw reishi mushroom in that, uh, which can relax sore and tense muscles. They put lemon balm in that to support with your sleep. They put uh, turkey tail mushroom, which is this really good medicinal mushroom for your immune system, even ginger for those achy muscles and joints. Uh, you can give some to your grandma, sip it along with grandma. She sits in a rocking chair for her joints and her sleep. And I'm sorry, I just offended all the grandmas out there who are like not in rocking chairs with poor joints. I'm just stereotyping. So Anyways, uh, Organifi has given a 20% discount off of this wonderful tasting brew. Very simple. You go to Organ. I keep saying that. Very simple. Because it, it is. It's very simple. You go to Organifi.com slash Ben. That's Organifi with an I dot com slash Ben and use code BENG20 to get 20% off. What I've realized and what impresses me is that men are just actually a really good person. Like seeing how mindful and intentional I'm he is. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> Three days in the yeah. But seeing how intentional he is with, with his kids and his wife. They, um, we were going to a horse farm tour one morning and they hadn't had time to do their gratitude journal, so they did it in the car um, on the way there. 
every meal, they take a deep breath in and they talk about what they're grateful for. To see how this kids, he, he enjoys his kids and he lets them have a great time, but he's looking for all these teachable moments. It's really been inspiring. I feel like I should tell you that because you all know the other stuff, but you may not realize that. Now, how does that help you right now? It doesn't. So luckily, he's also really smart. He's going to give you some great knowledge right now. I've, I've learned a lot from, from Matt and Mike, too, uh, about the, the genetic SNP stuff they do. They, you can actually learn more from 23andMe than your risk for having a unibrow or, or uh, <laughs> preferring sweet versus salty things. So they, they, they do a lot with genetics. And I'll, I'll touch on that during my presentation as well. But when, uh, when these guys told me they wanted me to talk a little bit about self-quantification, um, really, really where my mind went was kind of going beyond just like, you know, the, the Fitbit or even, you know, something like, like an aura ring or some of these things we can use to track sleep and steps and really delve into taking some of your health into your own hands. Uh, looking at things like the type of tests that you can order online nowadays, you know, stuff you would have paid you know, $10,000 for a decade ago at the, the Princeton Longevity Institute or you know things that, that execs are going to places like the Health Nucleus in California to do. There, there, there's so much that we can now learn uh, just from, from our own computer browser via an email inbox when our PDF results from some you know, home blood test or that, that stool that we annoyed our spouse with by keeping in the refrigerator for a couple days before we mail it off to the stool lab. <laughs> you open my refrigerator and see. You want to be careful. Don't eat the stew in our fridge until you ask first. But uh, there's a lot that you can that you can learn now, and that you can find out yourself by by ordering a lot of different labs online and paying attention to certain parameters. And, and granted, there's thousands of different things that you can track. I mean, I, I, I know that a lot of you, just from the few conversations that I've already had this morning, seem to be be pretty keen on health and pretty self educated. But you know, when when, when it comes to to, to digging through these thousands of different biomarkers that you can track. What I wanted to do today was just identify some of the things that I think are the best parameters to track, especially if you're interested in kind of that ideal combination of health span and lifespan. And then I also want to get into some, some of the tech, some of, some of the stuff like, like ketone monitoring and blood glucose monitoring and telomere analysis and, and a few of these things that go beyond what you might test for on a standard blood panel. Uh, and, and basically the goal here is to allow you guys to walk away with, with a pretty good working idea of some of the lowest hanging fruit in terms of quantifying what's really going to move the dial for you in terms of, of health span or, or lifespan. So, uh, and, and, and you know, you've already learned a little bit of that from from uh, from Mike's presentation. Now you all know why we didn't get to have almonds for breakfast because it would have screwed half of you and you probably had a heart attack right and left here. So, so yeah, we just ate bacon and avocados instead because there's no genetic sense for those apparently. So, uh, a, quick, uh, a quick background. I know that, that a lot of you listen to to my podcast. Uh, and know my background, where I'm coming from, but, but specifically when it comes to quantification and, and where I'm coming from when, when, when we're talking about testing things like your blood and your biomarkers, you know, I, I started off back in college when I was studying physiology and biomechanics, and I really got hardcore into bodybuilding, which is why I'm showing you a photograph of me right now, half naked. Uh, more than half naked, I guess. I guess that's about 92%. <laughs> The, the, the thing is that you know, bodybuilding is kind of like this old school, like original biohacking kind of sport where, you know, people are constantly tweaking and testing different macronutrient ratios of gaining weight, losing weight rapidly, gaining, gaining muscle, losing fat at a, at a pretty rapid pace. And so that initially got me kind of interested early on in the day of, you know, what, what can you do to really bring the body from, from good to great, not necessarily from a health standpoint in this case, but just from, from a pure uh, physique standpoint. Then after that, I got into Ironman triathlon. And I raced Ironman triathlon for about 10 years, and it was about like six years into that, which, which would have been uh, six, seven years ago, 
that I actually started to dig into and order tests from some of these companies that, that were popping up. You know, a few of the physicians that I interviewed on my podcast offered me blood, blood panels for me, and I started to dig into some of these early services that were online where you could order some of your own lab work, like uh, you know, direct labs, for example, or Genova Diagnostics, and, and I'd start to tweak and test some of my parameters, and I thought I was freaking fit. Right. I had, a, I had an aerobic engine that could go for days and and looked really good in spandex and I could ride a bike quickly. But when I started to get my lab results back, I, I was pretty shocked at what I saw. Right, I was I had a hypercholesterolemia, or at least it appeared that I did. I probably didn't. I'll explain explain why when I talk to you guys about hormones later on. I had rampant amounts of inflammation and CRP value that I'll, that I'll talk to you about as well today. I had pre-type 2 diabetes based on my, on my fasting blood glucose levels. I had a lot of shit going south in my body despite me being healthy on the outside, right? I, I was that stereotypical athlete who was healthy on the outside but dying on the inside or at least far from optimized on the inside. That, that actually, that initial testing when I, when I was fit but, but really truly unfit was what inspired me to write that, that first book I wrote, Beyond Training, where I, where I started to figure out you know, what, what can an athlete do to kind of find that ideal balance between performance and, and health and longevity. And so that, that, that's what really got me interested in this stuff was realizing, well, geez, we, we can look good, we can feel kind of sort of good, but we can be kind of dying a slow death on the inside and not know about it. And then um, you know, now I do a lot of off-field course racing. I, I still race for Spartan. I, I still dabble around in the mud and the barbed wire. And, and you know, I don't, I don't profess some of these masochistic sports to be healthy, but, but I still try to keep a, a, a pretty good idea of what's going on inside my body using a lot of the tactics that I'm about to show to you. And I don't think that, that this is something that you need to do if you're, you know, just because you, you want to be, say, like a professional athlete or do an Ironman or do a Spartan race. I mean, I sometimes get pain in this corner of somebody who, who only works with pro athletes. I and mean, frankly, Matt and I were talking about this in the car the other day. I mean, 80% of the people I work with, they're just like, CEOs, execs, people who want to live a long time, people who want to feel good, people who want to sleep better, people who have gut issues that they want to fix. I'm not even working with that many pro athletes anymore. I'm primarily working with people who just want to feel good and live a long time. So, so don't think that a lot of these things I'm going to talk to you about are just stuff you go out and do if you if you want to say race an Ironman triathlon. We're, we're talking about things that I think are important for the general population. So, uh, so harping on what I was talking a little bit about earlier. Um, <laughs> What I want to go through today are, are some of the best blood and biomarker evaluations that you can do on yourself initially. I'm going to give you guys uh, specifically 12 of the best biomarkers that you can test. Some stuff that flies under the radar, um, some stuff that you might already have a, have a decent <coughs> knowledge of. I'm not saying that what I'm about to show you is, is all you ever want to test for. But when I sat down and thought about what I wanted to talk to you about today, I was trying to identify some of the things that you might find interesting that go beyond, let's, let's say, um, you know, like vitamin D or, or total cholesterol or some of the things that, that you know, you, you, you get done as just kind of an average everyday bloody valve and, and some of the stuff that moves the dial a little bit more. So as we go through, uh, you've got Matt's uh, cell phone number so that you can drunk dial him later on or, or send, send, send him obscene photographs of yourself. Uh, and, and Matt's writing his number down on the board there. And I, if you have questions, you can text them over to Matt. And that way I'll just I'll roll through and then I would say we can either save all of our questions for the end, or if Matt sees a question is just like super duper relevant, we don't want to skip over it, he'll just interrupt me and, and ask the question right then and there. And uh, we basically got, how long do we have here, Matt, to, for, for, for folks? Long just long. so we long give, long. give people out of it. As long as we want. All right, we'll, we'll break about 7 p.m. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go for a while, and, and depending on how quickly we get through this stuff, I did work in the opportunity for, for a pee break. You're welcome. First question. Uh, for a brief second. We already have a question. I didn't even start yet. <laughs> questions. What Please. product do you use in your hair? It looks amazing. <laughs> the trick is you just don't wash your hair, you let it get super oily, and then you throw your hands in the Yeah. 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 Pomade. 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 Matter of fact, I can tell you exactly what's in my hair right now. 
badger ball pomade. That's right. It's got to be clean enough to be able to eat it. That's, the, that's my only rule for what goes in my hair. Besides from that, I'm a complete dummy. I just kind of grab what happens to be in there. So before we get into what 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 parameters you want to look for in your blood biomarkers, it's kind of important for you to understand that when you get the results back from, from an average, let, let's say, a, a comprehensive metabolic panel and, and a complete blood count from your doc and you're looking through all these reference ranges and, and uh, they're going over it with you or you're looking at, at it yourself and you're just kind of, this is what a lot of people do, right? They look for, oh, what's, what's marked high and what's marked low? Like, like and they'll just kind of skip over everything else and, and pay attention to what seems to be leaping out from the left. A lot of times when you get your results, it'll be like a big bold number that says too high or too low or you know, something like wellness FX where something will pop up red and everything else is green. So you just pay attention to, to the red part. The problem is multifold when it comes to interpreting this data uh, and, and taking caution with the reference ranges that they give you. I mean, what you're looking at right here is just, you know, it's this basic parabolic curve from a statistical analysis. And the way that these curves work is you've got about 95% of the population that fits into the middle of the curve. And then you've got 2.5% or so on either side of that reference range that's relatively unaccounted for on these lab tests. And part of that is due to the biochemical individuality that you, know, that you can read about in, in a book by the same name, an excellent old book called Biochemical Individuality by Roger Williams. And you, you thumb through that book and it shows how there's like 12 different sizes of the stomach and all these different shapes of the liver and, and certain people excrete vitamin D at an extremely rapid rate, and some people hold on to vitamin D so well that they can get vitamin D toxicity from the average multivitamin. I mean, it's a fantastic book written in the 60s, but it just goes into all the different ways that we operate biochemically. Then you combine that with what Mike was talking to us about when it comes to genetic individuality and a lot of these SNPs, and you get a pretty good idea that you, know, you might fall into that 5% of the population or I think more that these reference ranges don't account for, right? So, so if you're looking at say like your, your alanine aminotransferase or aspartate aminotransferase liver enzymes and it's telling you that your liver is just fine because your enzymes are at a certain level, that does not necessarily mean that that certain level is what's healthy for you. That's what's healthy for the general population. You could say the same thing about thyroid. You could say the same thing about vitamin D. So there's a great deal of biochemical and genetic individuality that needs to be taken into account. Uh, you, you can see here point number one that I've already written out explaining you. 5% of people fall outside the curve. Another thing is that ranges tend to widely vary from lab to lab. Meaning that typically, when, you, when you're getting a test, the reference ranges that that lab is using, those are supplied to them by the test manufacturer, whether that be Genova Diagnostics or, uh, or, or, or Metametrics or, or any of these other companies that are, that are producing these tests. What labs are supposed to do is they're supposed to go out and get, get a third-party eval to see if those reference ranges actually are correct and, and fall within the value that that test manufacturer is recommended. The fact is, most labs don't do that. So you might test with one lab and it'll tell you your vitamin D levels are perfectly normal. You might test with another lab, it'll tell you your vitamin D levels aren't. It'll give you different reference ranges. And as you'll learn about when I talk about, say, food allergy testing, different labs in many cases are using different tests that are using different forms of evaluation. So you need to understand that your value is going to vary widely from lab to lab or even from physician to physician. So that's another problem with reference ranges. Number three that I've written here, and this is a big one, a lot of reference ranges, they reflect the absence of disease. The absence of disease, not necessarily the ability for you to go from good to great or for you to say, you know, live until you're more than 100. It's just, hey, is this person going to gonna drop dead in the next few months or not? You, know, you could use an example such as your thyroid, right? The, typically what, what a laboratory or, or a reference range will reveal is that if your, your TSH, your thyroid stimulating hormone, is below 4, that you're pretty good. Your thyroid's doing okay. But when you look at thyroid dysregulation, a lot of people, whether it's autoimmune thyroid issues, whether it's inadequate conversion of T4 to T3 due to high cortisol or low blood sugar, whatever the case may be, they actually do better with a TSH that's below 2. I mean, when I'm looking over a, a client's labs or their blood or their biomarkers, 
I'm looking for a TSH that falls between 0 0.5 to 2. If I'm scrolling through, let's say, uh, let's say a, a wellness FX lab report, and I get to the thyroid section, I get to TSH, and it shows, hey, green, you're doing just fine. Your, your TSH is at 3.82. Well, to me, that that's actually not a great TSH. Sure, that that. That, that's going to indicate that I might not have full-blown hypothyroidism, but it's not an indication of really great thyroid function, right? So, so you want to take into account the fact that many of these reference ranges do not reflect good to great. The same could be said for, for inflammation or magnesium or any of these other parameters that I'm about to show you. So you need to realize that many of the lab reference ranges are absence of disease and not necessarily your potential for longevity or for health span. And then the final thing is that, and, and this shops, you'll get lab reference ranges and they vary, they, they, they should vary widely based on whether you're male or whether you're female. And, and when I show you some of the reference ranges that you should be looking for when you get results from a lab test that you've done, or maybe your doctor goes through your results with you, but you want to go through them yourself using some of the information that I'm about to provide to you. A lot of times, male versus female isn't accounted for. I mean, uh, uh, a perfect example of that would be, uh, you know, iron. You know, iron is something that, as you'll learn later on, can be, uh, it's an element that can essentially rust you from the inside out. And, and men, technically, should have a, a, a lower iron value than, than women have. Another one would be uh, your liver enzymes that I talked about earlier, like your ALT and your AST. Those are supposed to be a lot lower for females than they are for males, but most lab reference ranges just spit out numbers and don't say, hey, this is what your number should be if you're female. This is what your number should be if you're male. And so there's all sorts of problems when you're going through the results that you need to be aware of. And so take some notes as I show you some of the things that you should be looking at today. And by the way, I should have told you this at the beginning, but if I go back here to my introductory slide, I will make these slides available to you so you don't have to memorize all these values. Not that you guys don't have minds like steel traps and, and eight cups of coffee in your systems right now. You can't, you can't memorize all this. But if you go to bengreefieldfitness.com slash Kentucky Castle 1-9, you can download the slides and I'll also include articles, podcasts, scientific papers, and references for a lot of the things that I talk to you about for you nerds who want to take an even deeper dive or, or just read a lot of stuff related to, to some of the other things. Hey, I want to interrupt today's show to tell you about a place you need to shop at if you're healthy or trying to get healthy. Uh, what they do is they sell non-GMO food, snacks, vitamins, personal care products, eco-friendly cleaning supplies, safe and non-toxic beauty products, kitchen staples, home goods, organic baby food. Uh, for those of you who have babies or who like to eat baby food, they've even got a clean and curated clean wine program where they meticulously source all their wines for low environmental impact. They have a master sommelier on staff who taste them and they affordably price all their stuff. I know you're, you're chomping at the bits to know who this is. What is this mysterious website that you speak of, Ben? Uh, I'm not done yet, though. Over 98% of their packaging is post-consumer recycled and filled with recycled paper, denim, or newspaper wraps instead of plastic bubbles. So that's 100% zero waste. Uh, their catalog has tons and tons of stuff you aren't going to find on any of their websites, like let's say you know Amazon, for example. Uh, it's like Amazon meets Whole Foods. Not only that, but uh, these folks are going to give everybody a free 30-day trial to their online healthy shopping uh, website. It's called Thrive, Thrive Market. So thrivemarket.com slash Ben is where you can shop. You're going to get that free 30-day trial, but it's not over yet. You also get 25% off your first order. And considering that their prices are already marked down 25 to 50%, and they're giving you an extra 25% off your first order, plus a free 30-day trial, you would be a fool not to pull the trigger on Thrive Market. So uh, again, you go to thrivemarket.com slash Ben. That's thrivemarket.com slash Ben. Today's podcast episode is also brought to you by Whoop. What is Whoop? Whoop is a self-quantification device. It's a strap that you wear on your wrist. It's got a heart rate monitor that measures your heart 100 times per second, 24-7. It looks at heart rate variability. It looks at sleep quality. It looks at uh, calories burned, of course, average heart rate, the amount of exertion you have throughout the day, deep sleep, light sleep, 
REM sleep, really accurate sleep monitoring, even a built-in sleep coach that looks at your your day of training or your previous sleep performance and provides the perfect sleep times for you. When you need to go to bed, slaps your wrist, tells you to get your ass up onto the pillow. No, it doesn't do that, but it does It does tell you. It does notify you. Uh, and a lot of really good heart rate insights. So it's got this cool little like online membership that comes along with your Whoop, and they're giving uh, everybody uh, $30 off a whoop if you get a 12 or an 18 month membership uh, along with their band uh and it's very very uh simple <laughs> go to whoop uh whoop.com w-h-o-o-p.com and your code is greenfield over at whoop.com so whoop.com slash greenfield check it out get you a whoop so let's go ahead and just jump into the good stuff here some of the lab parameters, specifically I'm going to go, be going through 12 different things that I think you should look at and uh, test for if you're really going to take some of your health into your own hands. The first is RBC magnesium. RBC stands for red blood cell, red blood cell magnesium. Now, this is an important one to look for based on the fact that, as you can see here, it's going to indicate things like insulin sensitivity, physical performance, can affect sleep and sleep architecture. Potential for sarcopenia, which is the loss of muscle as you age. Uh, you know, whenever I reference here what type of, of physical or biological degradation could occur as a result of one of these parameters being out of whack, most of this is based off of the actual research that shows these are the biggest things to worry about if this number is not optimized. So in the case of RBC magnesium, we'll get insulin sensitivity, physical performance, and sarcopenia potential. The problem is that when you get a blood test, a lot of times it's looking at intracellular magnesium, which is not bioavailable magnesium. What you need to instead look at, oh, I'm sorry, it's looking at extracellular magnesium, which is not bioavailable magnesium used by the cells. You need to look for intracellular magnesium. So that, that's what an RBC magnesium test looks for. So when you're getting your blood analyzed and you get your magnesium values back, if it says it's low or if it says it's high, the first thing you need to look into is whether or not that's an RBC magnesium. You need to ask your doctor, is this an RBC magnesium or is this an extracellular magnesium? Because those two differences are very important. Now what you need to be looking for for ideal ranges when you look at that result is about 6.0 to 6.5. There are a few cases that I'm going to show you today where it's going to be different between men versus women, but for RPC magnesium, generally 6.0 to 6.5 is where we're getting that ideal combination of health span, performance, and lifespan. So that's what you want to look for on a magnesium evaluation. You can also, there's a company called Intracellular Diagnostics, and Intracellular Diagnostics will also evaluate magnesium via tongue scrape. That's also a very accurate evaluation to and a way to look at your magnesium levels. So magnesium is number one. Anybody have questions about, about magnesium, by the way? You can text Matt if you do, or if there's like super relevant stuff that pops up so as I'm talking, you can go ahead and raise your hand, whether it's like, you know, how do I supplement with this? How do I get more of this? How do I, how do I fix this, et cetera? Um, you know, in most cases, what I'm recommending right now to most of my clients who are low in red blood cell magnesium is just using magnesium in the evening. And there's different forms. I like to I like to get different forms of magnesium, like magnesium three and eight, magnesium glycinate, magnesium citrate. There's a company called uh, Jigsaw Health that I personally use. They make a, a like a triplicate form of magnesium called Meg SRT. So in most cases, I'm I'm using anywhere from from 400 to 600 milligrams of a mix of magnesium at night. That keeps the RBC magnesium levels pretty dialed in, especially if you're eating a lot of mineral-rich food, growing, growing mineral-rich soil, and organic produce, that kind of thing. Um, the next one is estradiol, and a lot of people think, especially men, that paying attention to estrogen levels is only something that women need to do. But estrogen is actually something I think flies under the radar as far as something we need to pay attention to. You can see here what I've listed, all the different things that low estrogen levels or optimized estrogen levels would affect. Bone mass, oxidative stress, or your antioxidant potential, your nitric oxide production, glutathione, one of, one of the main antioxidants in your body, uh, muscle repair, muscle strength, non-optimized estradiol levels are going to affect all of those things, so it's an important number to look at. Uh, for men, I've got the ideal ranges written right here, 10 to 82 picograms per milliliter. That's what you need to look for on your results. Women, it's, it's going to fluctuate based on where you're at in your cycle. 
but you can see some of the different values here for women, less than 50 picograms per milliliter during menstrual periods, up to 200 during follicular development, up to 400 just before ovulation. Now, when it comes to measuring hormones, the problem is that blood measurements will often just give you a snapshot of what's going on with those hormones, and they also won't show you the upstream and downstream metabolites of those hormones. I'm a bigger fan of a salivary or, even better, a urine test to evaluate your hormones. A salivary test can at least give you, via four to five different salivary measurements in a 24-hour cycle, what's occurring during the entire day because your hormones are supposed to fluctuate during the entire day. If you're just driving to a lab in the morning or your doctor does, does your labs at 8 a.m. in the morning, gives you that one-time blood snapshot of a hormone, you're not getting the full picture. An adrenal stress index, a salivary index, can give you a little bit more data, but what I'm going to show you in a couple minutes here are the results of something called a Dutch test, which is a dry urine test for hormones. And this one's great because it not only gives you what the adrenal stress index gives you as far as how your hormones are fluctuating during the day, because basically what you're doing is you're peeing on a strip at five different points during a 24-hour cycle, uh, but it can also give you the upstream and the downstream metabolites of those hormones. So you can see, and I'll, I'll give you an example of cortisol, for example, and why this is important, why you might get a blood test that says you're super duper high in cortisol and you need to meditate and, and do yoga and, and listen to any of what you do, your enemas, and all this stuff below cortisol. In many cases, it's actually not the fact that your cortisol is high. It's, it's a, the issue is that the cortisol is not being broken down adequately. So we'll get into the Dutch panel a little bit, but estradiol is the second one in addition to RBC magnesium that I think you need to look at and track. Kind of opposite of estrogen or estradiol would be testosterone, and you know, men think that only women need to track estradiol, women think that only men need to track testosterone, but the fact is both sexes should be paying attention to both of these hormones. In the case of testosterone, we're looking at libido, sexual performance, energy, strength, bone density, muscle mass, cardiovascular disease, and overall mortality if testosterone levels are not optimized. I'm not necessarily saying that everybody needs to be on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, even though that, that's a very good strategy, I think, as you age, assuming that it's overseen by a doctor and you're testing frequently to make sure levels are optimized. But you should at least be paying attention to different things you can do to optimize hormones. Now, the, the biggie with hormones is that they can be bound up by proteins. You, know, you look at testosterone, for example, testosterone, your total testosterone can be bound up by two different things, albumin proteins or sex hormone binding globulin. Now, if your total testosterone is bound up by albumin proteins, it's still relatively bioavailable. More importantly, if your total testosterone is bound up by sex hormone binding globulin, it's not as bioavailable. You'll oftentimes find that if your cortisol is truly very high, your sex hormone binding globulin is also high because it's almost that message that, 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 that nature sends your body that it doesn't want you to make babies in times of stress, right? So you got a lot of cortisol going on, you produce more sex hormone binding globulin to bind up that total testosterone to keep it from being free, free and active and keeping your, your libido elevated or keeping you from being sexually active. So the idea is that you want about 2% of your testosterone to be free. So if you look, let's, let's say you're a guy, you get your total testosterone measured, you're trying to figure out if, free, if your free testosterone is where it's supposed to be, 2% of it should be free. So your T level should be at least 1 to 49 free T to bound T. Bound T being what's bound to sex hormone binding globulin and what's bound to albumin. So if your total testosterone is 500 nanograms per deciliter, then your free T levels would need to be right around 10 nanograms per deciliter. I'm a bigger fan of paying attention to free T versus just total T. Because some guys will have what might be considered to be low total T, like let's say you're, you're a 350 or something like that, but they've actually got free T levels that are pretty good, that are even higher than 2% of that total value. On the flip side, you'll see guys walking around with like, you know, 1,000, 1,100 of total T, or you know, in some cases even guys on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, large amounts of total T, but because they're so stressed out or there's other things going on that, that are causing the total T to be bound, a lot of that testosterone just isn't bioavailable. So it's important to pay attention to your total testosterone and also to your free testosterone. So I've got a few values here for you. For free T, you're usually looking at ideal levels being about 4.6 up to 22.4. 
and your bioavailable T, which is your albumin-bound testosterone, because remember, if, it's, if albumin is bound to testosterone, it's still bioavailable. Sex hormone binding globulin is bound to testosterone, it's less available. You want that to range from 110 to 575 nanograms per deciliter. For women, it's a lot lower, obviously. It ranges from 0.02 to 0.5 nanograms per deciliter, with ideal levels of bioavailable T from 0.5 to 8.5. The other thing that, that I always like to take a quick glance at if I'm measuring hormones like estradiol or testosterone is DHEA because DHEA is such an androgenic hormone. It's a precursor to estradiol, to cortisol, to testosterone. DHEA levels should ideally be optimized as well. That's why I like, for example, the Dutch test because it'll look at testosterone, it'll look at estrogen, it looks at freaking melatonin, it looks at cortisol, it looks at DHEA. So DHA is another very, very good one to look at. Uh, it's it's going to range quite a bit based on age. I'm going to show you here what DHA levels tend to fluctuate like. What you're looking at right here is the reference range of DHA for males. You can see that as you go from 0 to 100 on this scale, it ranges everywhere from 5 all the way up to 30 in terms of nanograms per milliliter. So it's going to change as you age. And this is another issue with reference ranges. You don't just pay attention to whether you're male versus female. But it's also, in some cases, especially with hormones, going to vary widely in terms of ideal levels as you age. So you can use a chart like this, for example, which would be ideal levels of DHA as you age. You can look at your results, say, okay, I'm 40 years old. Therefore, based on that, my ideal levels are going to be somewhere between, you know, approximately, if you look at this chart, like, you know, 8 up to, up to 25. And I've got references in the, in the slides if you want to go and, and look at an actual uh, reference from where this came, if you want to match up the numbers more precisely. Here's another graph that shows your reference ranges for females. So when it comes to hormones, like I mentioned, I wanted to, to briefly touch on this Dutch test. This is what you're looking at right now is a screenshot of the Dutch test results. And it's kind of cool because it's almost got like this plot-like graph that goes from a low range up to a high range to show you if your numbers fall within the right parameters. And remember, this is this is the urine test that you do, the dry urine test. You can order this to your own house, you can do it yourself. But for example, with the Dutch test, uh, you can see here what I've written, that the free cortisol, so the majority of cortisol in your body circulates found a corticosteroid binding globulin and albumin. And about less than 5% of that circulating cortisol is free, but it's only the free cortisol that's able to be active within the body uh, that can access the enzyme transporters in, in, in organs. Now, free cortisone is also measured by the Dutch test, which is a corticosteroid-related cortisol. Creatinine, which is a breakdown byproduct of creatine, and then a few different other metabolites of cortisol breakdown. Why is all this important? Because I can see your eyes starting to glaze over when you talk about all these different forms of, of cortisol. Well, like I mentioned, I tested, and I, I got test after test, blood test after blood test that said I had high cortisol and hypercortisol. I need to take my phosphatidyl serine and do my transcendental meditation and do yoga and not train so much. Well, it turns out that what I actually found when I did my Dutch panel was that it wasn't that my adrenal glands were just producing cortisol 24-7 because they were so stressed out. Because it kind of puzzled me because I didn't feel like I was that stressed out. Instead, that cortisol just wasn't being broken down into its metabolites. Right? My cortisol metabolites were very high. So what did this indicate? Something was going on in my body that was keeping my cortisol from being broken down. Upon further investigation, it turns out that a couple of things... That can, that can limit your ability to be able to break down cortisol would be inadequate amounts of storage glycogen. I was on a very strict ketogenic diet at the time while training. Another thing that can affect it is your thyroid activity. And lo and behold, my TSH really was somewhere between four and five, right? I had very low amounts of bioavailable T3, so I wasn't getting adequate T4 to T3 conversion. Also probably because I was following a very strict ketogenic diet and being very active. So it turns out that for me, it's not about meditation, sleep, and de-stressing, which it could be for some people. For me, it was about eating more carbohydrates, paying attention to my training a little bit more carefully, and optimizing my thyroid, getting adequate iodine, getting adequate selenium, eating some organ meats, and taking, it, take, taking that approach versus just lowering cortisol. So as you can see, you can learn some very practical things from a Dutch panel that give you deeper insight into what's going on with your, with your hormones. 
Uh, it will also test DHEA, like I mentioned, progesterone and progesterone metabolites, all of your different forms of testosterone, and even melatonin as well, so it can be, be an adequate test to kind of dig into sleep architecture a little bit. So that, that's why I like the Dutch test for measuring hormones. Number six, number six out of 12, although I think this might be number five out of 12 because I had some issue on the slide there. Right? I don't know if you guys noticed, I both testosterone said both three and four, so we might be doing 11, not 12. But like Matt said, I, I graduated when I was, I was 15, so I didn't get through as much math as I probably should have. But yeah, my counting's a little off. Yeah. Um, once I run out of fingers, I'm screwed. So, uh, high sensitivity C reactive protein. This is that HSCRP I was talking about. Remember how I said that when I was racing, I felt really good. I looked good in spandex. I had an aerobic engine that could go for days, but I had rampant amounts of inflammation. Now this is important because of the link between inflammation and specifically heart attack risk. Now a lot of people will go in and they'll get they'll get their inflammation tested and it'll be their HSCRP will be 0 0.8, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. When, when you get above 10.0, that's typically a really big sign that you probably you've had a heart attack, you're right on the verge of a heart attack. But with CRP, it is important to realize that if you're looking at it, you worked out the day prior, especially if you did some form of eccentric exercise the day prior. When I say eccentric exercise, I mean something that will cause the muscles to have to decelerate. Usually the top two are running or weightlifting. Your CRP levels are going to be artificially elevated. So you don't have to worry as much about this number if you worked out hard the day prior. Typically, if I'm going to go in for a lab test, I, I still like to work out every day. I don't just sit around and eat Twinkies before I go in for a lab test. But I'll just do like swimming, yoga, sauna, a little bit of cycling, like things that aren't tearing down the muscles quite as much, so my CRP levels aren't artificially elevated. Now, when it comes to CRP, the other important reason that you need to pay attention to this is because if you have rampant levels of, of inflammation, and you're also following some of the, the trickle-down advice we're seeing a lot in the health industry right now, which is like, pay attention to really good forms of cholesterol, eat your eggs, eat your avocados, have fatty cuts of fish, make sure that you're getting enough fatty acids into your body. The problem is that high amounts of inflammation can cause oxidation of that cholesterol. And in many cases, when I'm looking at someone's lipid panel, which I'll get into here in a second, I go straight and I look at inflammation, I look at blood glucose, because those are two factors that can cause cholesterol to become atherosclerotic. I mean, I personally try to keep my total cholesterol above 200, based on the fact that that's great for hormones, it's been shown in research to be wonderful for your intellectual development, especially as you age, but I would be screwed if I had high total cholesterol and my CRP was elevated and my blood glucose was elevated. I'll get into cholesterol particles here in a second, but CRP is another one that's very important to pay attention to. Sure, there are a lot of other inflammatory markers like fibrinogen and cytokines and all these other things that we test for inflammation, but CRP is such low-hanging fruit and such an easy blood test to get that I recommend that you look at that one as well. So next is your triglyceride to HDL ratio. I just mentioned that if I'm looking at a lipid panel on someone, I, go, I, I pay a lot of attention to CRP and the blood glucose, but one of the other biggies that I pay attention to is the triglyceride to HDL ratio. This is actually called your atherosclerotic index because it has been shown to be far more important in terms of determining your risk for cardiovascular disease and your true cardiovascular health. Far more important than total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol. And you don't even have to get a fancy cholesterol particle lab test called an NMR profile to look at this number. You can get this number just off a basic plain Jane lipid profile that you get from the average doctor. So let me show you what you want to be looking for when it comes to your trig to HDL ratio, which indicates, as I've written here, all cause mortality, heart disease, and insulin resistance. Three biggies that take out a lot of people that influence both health span and lifespan are influenced by this trig to HDL number. So ideally, if you're looking at trends as you change your diet and you become healthy, triglycerides should generally go down over time, HDL should generally go up over time. What you want to look for for your ratios, your trig to HDL ratio, lower is better, you want to be below one. This is the problem with reference ranges. A lot of times reference ranges will look at whether or not you're below four. I think that that's bad news bears if, you're you know, if your triglycerides are at, say, uh, 150 and your HDL is at 40. In many cases, a, a lab 
result will tell you you're doing just fine <coughs> with this index of atherosclerosis, and that's simply not the case. I think I called it an index of atherosclerosis. I believe it's actually called an atherogenic index. Don't quote me on that. But it's uh, anyways, your, your trig to HDL ratio is very important. It should be lower. I like to see it below one. Meaning, what would below one mean? It would mean low triglycerides, high HDL, right? You want low triglycerides, high HDL. For example, someone says, well, how do you get your triglycerides low? And how do you get your HDL high? HDL responds very favorably to things like omega-3 fatty acid sources, such as fish oil, for example. Fish oil supplementation has been shown to be wonderful for increasing HDL. If you ask the people who design the food pyramid, they'll tell you whole grains increase HDL. They do, like eating a diet of quinoa and amaranth and millet and oats and whole wheat bread. That will all increase your HDL. The problem is that many of those foods have the same glycemic index as a Snickers bar. So yeah, you're increasing your HDL, but you're also keeping your blood glucose relatively elevated simultaneously. Instead, from a dietary standpoint, plant intake, dark leafy greens, adequate fiber intake, a lot of these seem to positively favor HDL. And some people will say, well, what if I'm on the carnivore diet? What if, what if I'm doing like the low vegetable, low roughage thing? Well, heck, you, you get lots of fatty acids from, from your grass-fed, grass-finished ribeye steak and your sardines and your anchovy and your mackerel and your salmon. So there's more than one way to skin the cat when it comes to HDL. But ultimately, no matter what you do, you want to keep it elevated. And when it comes to triglycerides, well, exercise and caloric control is one of the best ways to decrease triglycerides, so that your, your body isn't having to, having to shove all these fatty acids into storage tissue. But two things that really elevate triglycerides are your intake of processed sugars and starches and your intake of vegetable oils. Like if you can adjust for those two things, you'll, you'll see your triglycerides start to go down. So it's almost like eat more plants slash fiber slash slightly limited amounts of whole grains or just fatty acids overall while decreasing vegetable oils and starches and you tackle this index pretty thoroughly. The other one to pay attention to that's interesting, a lot of people don't look at is your HDL to total cholesterol ratio. So lower is better, and again, even if you don't get a particle count, an NMR profile particle count, which I'll talk about in a second, this can still give you a decent idea because it's correlated to particle count. So if you look at your HDL to total cholesterol, uh, let, let's say your HDL is at, at 70 and your total cholesterol is 190, great, because you want that ratio to be 0 0.24 or higher. 0 0.24 or higher for your HDL to total cholesterol. So you can very easily, if your doctor sent you a PDF or a printout of your lab results, just go look at HDL, go look at total cholesterol, go look at triglycerides, and you can calculate all of these numbers yourself and see if you're really truly falling into the range that you want to be at. Okay, number eight, I'm going to keep harping on lipids here. A full lipid panel along with an omega-3 index. If someone really truly wants to look at everything that's going on, specifically from a fats and a fatty acid standpoint, this is what you want to ask your doctor, your functional medicine doc, your integrative medical practitioner, your, these guys use the, the stupid term precision medicine. I think they just made that up to sound smart. But uh, I'm just kidding. Precision medicine, functional medicine, integrative medicine, you name it. You want to ask for, for, for a full lipid panel, which would be like an NMR panel with an omega-3 index. This can indicate cardiovascular risk and inflammation. Here is what you want to look for. And when it comes to this NMR profile, what it's actually telling you is the size of your cholesterol particles. You've probably heard this before. You know, guys like uh, you know, Dr. Peter Atia, he has a wonderful six-part interview series with Dr. Thomas Dayspring, where they take a deep dive into cholesterol and cholesterol particles. But the general idea, I mean, summed up in 10 seconds, is you want your particles to be large, fluffy particles and not small atherogenic particles, and you generally want your particle count to be low. Well. That's what you want to be looking for. Total LDL particles should be less than 1,000 nanomoles per liter. Okay, that's a, that's a big important one. Total small LDL particles, less than 600. I also have some sizes here. LDL size should be greater than 21 nanomoles. Or, or nanometers, ACL size should be greater than 9 millimole per liter, VLDL should be less than 0 0.1 nanomole per liter. This is what you want to look for if you get a full NMR panel that's actually telling you your particle count. Now the other thing is an omega-3 index to go hand-in-hand -hand with this, which actually measures the EPA 
and the DHA in your red blood cell membranes. Okay, so it's an index. You can see the example here is that I've written is if you have 64 fatty acids in a cell membrane, and three of those fatty acids are comprised of EPA and DHA, you would have an omega index of 4.6. Okay, that, that's how that calculation would go. Now, an index of 8% or higher is ideal, meaning you want your index to be higher when it comes to your omega-3 index, the amount of EPA and DHA in your cells. Most people are testing, especially in America, somewhere between about 4 and 6%, indicating in many cases they would be, from a dietary standpoint, consuming too many omega-6 fatty acids from vegetable oils, seeds, nuts, nut butters, parent essential oils, etc., and too little omega-3s from a more Mediterranean, you know, olive oil, avocado, olives, uh, you know, fatty fish, small fish like mackerel, anchovy, sardines, etc. Yeah, that's generally what you see. Vegetable oils are also a, a big, big issue when it comes to lowering your omega-3 index. So the highest risk zone being at 4% or below has actually been correlated to a 90% risk of sudden cardiac death. There's a reason I'm recommending the specific lab parameters that I'm recommending to you because these are the things that are very important when it comes to health span and lifespan. So an omega-3 index, you can also look at what's called your stearic acid to oleic acid ratio. That's the ratio of saturated to unsaturated fats in your cells. This is also very important. It's indicated for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, huge issue nowadays, prostate, colon, gallbladder cancer. You want that to be about 0.97 to 1.02. The nice part is if you have a test like this done, you can see I've written a few of the ways to get it here. Omega Quant has one, Great Plains has one, Quest has one, Wallace FX has one. If you get this test done, typically the PDF results that you'll get with it give you a pretty decent idea of your percentages and their reference ranges on those charts are good. But I mean, big picture is you want to look at 8% or higher for your omega-3 index. All right, we're already at number nine. IGF-1. You guys know which one this is, IGF-1? Dr. Ron Patrick talks about this a lot. Insulin-like growth factor one. And a lot of people who are kind of like in the fasting and autophagy sector talk about keeping IGF-1 low. Not eating too much dairy. Not eating too much protein and, and red meat especially. Being careful to not be in a constant state of growth activation, right? Not in a constant state of anabolism by using things like feast fast cycling, certain times of the year or certain times of the week when you're moderating or restricting your protein intake, not having red meat every day, not consuming dairy every day unless you're trying to grow into like a big high school football player. You're trying to take a, a little kid and get them get them up get them all fat and big. Like these are things that work for anabolism, but that directly conflict with any method that you want to use to increase longevity. So you want a sweet spot of IGF-1, in my opinion. Many people in our industry say, keep IGF-1 low. Well, I don't know about you, but if I'm not weightlifting and I'm not eating red meat, and all I'm doing are like cold showers and, and sauna and walking and eating vegetables, yeah, I might live till I'm 125, but I'm going to be like cold and libido and hungry, and like, I don't want to live a long time if that's what I'm going to feel the whole time. So in my opinion, you should instead look at life as a series of press-pull cycle, right? You have certain days where you lift heavy weights and you exercise hard and you have your big old ribeye steak for dinner, and then you have certain days that are a recovery day where you might say, okay, Sunday, I'm doing meditation, prayer, maybe spending an hour in the sauna reading a spiritual book, and I'm going to fast from Saturday dinner to Sunday at dinner. Right, so you've got that day where our IGF levels are very low, but then Monday you might be you know, lifting weights and having a nice cut of salmon or steak. So that's the idea with IGF-1. Now in terms of the actual values, the approximate sweet spot for longevity and performance, if you look at IGF-1 values on a lab test, is between 80 and 150. That's the range that you want to look at for IGF-1 if you want to limit your risk for dying early or for getting cancer from very elevated insulin or IGF-1 levels, but still feel good, be able to maintain muscle, be able to maintain libido, body temperature, etc. Okay, number 10 is very, very similar, and uh, I could say just about the same things about insulin as I could about IGF-1. For the same reasons I just named, you want to pay attention to insulin in addition to IGF-1. And insulin is, of course, also important to pay attention to 
because it is what's going to help partition nutrients that you eat, or specifically things like glucose that you consume into fat or into liver or into muscle, or allow those things to be stored. Constantly elevated insulin levels, you've no doubt heard this analogy before. If you constantly have insulin circulating through your bloodstream, your receptors eventually become insensitive to insulin, you create insulin resistance or insulin insensitivity. So you want to pay attention to insulin levels. A lot of times a normal blood test isn't showing you insulin, but you want to make sure you get that tested for in addition to your blood glucose. I'll talk to you about blood glucose testing later, but you can't you can't constantly measure blood glucose like you can constantly measure insulin. Like this weird thing on the back of my arm here, this is tracking my blood glucose 24-7. It's called a Dexcom G6. At any given point, I can pick up my phone, I can look at my phone, I can get what my blood glucose values are. I can see what a cup of coffee does to it, I can see what, you know, speaking on stage and in, in front of a, a, a bunch of grumpy people who didn't get to eat eggs for breakfast does to it. I, got, I can always know what my blood glucose is. They don't make that for insulin, so you, you actually need to get a blood insulin evaluation. You ideally want it to be below three. Some reference range will tell you below five. I'm a bigger fan of being below three international units per deciliter of insulin. Okay, so pay attention to your insulin levels as well. I got, uh, I got two more I want to get into with you here. Number one is called a complete blood count. This is a pretty standard panel that a doctor wrote. It's called a CBC with differential. CBC with differential is basically, in a nutshell, it's testing your white blood cells and your red blood cells. Why is this important? Well, your white blood cells are your immune cells, your red blood cells are your information carriers for things like oxygen and hemoglobin. Now, white blood cells, a consistently high white blood cell count, it's actually shocking how much of a risk there is with a high white blood cell count and increased death at an early age, particularly from cardiovascular disease. If you're looking at things like neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, all these things that get spat out when you get a complete blood count, if these things are constantly elevated, not only can it indicate that you've got constant inflammation, that you have some type of infection, sometimes you'll see these things elevated with Lyme, mold, mycotoxin exposure, etc. But basically, the research shows that you will die at an earlier age if you consistently have high white blood cell counts. That's why that's an important one to pay attention to. Uh, when it comes to very, very low white blood cell counts, a lot of times you'll see uh, like psychological depression or a depressed immune system or poor immune system function being associated with that. And there are reference ranges for these. Um, and like I mentioned, increased risk of mortality associated with high white blood cell counts is maintained over 40 years follow-up from these tests. So this is a pretty powerful thing to pay attention to. I've got some percentages out here for you because typically your white blood cell counts are reported in terms of percentages. Neutrophils, you want at 40 to 60 percent. Higher than that indicates viruses, autoimmune disease, or detox issues. Lymphocytes, you want at 25 to 40 percent. Higher would be increased risk of illness or chronic infection. Monocytes, 0 to 7 percent. Higher would be liver dysfunction, sometimes Epstein Barr or recovery from it for prostate issues. Eosinophils, 0 to 3. Higher than that, sometimes it indicates food sensitivities, environmental allergies, or parasites, basophils, 0 to 1 percent. Higher than that, a lot of times it indicates histamine intolerance. So here's an example of how you use this. Let's say you test, you constantly are showing high white blood cell counts, and in particular, you're noticing eosinophils are high. You haven't yet decided that you want to shovel out, say, $500 to $1,000 for something like a Cyrex food allergy panel, but you've seen this on the past two blood tests that you've done, these eosinophils being elevated, so finally you decide, okay, my white blood cell counts are showing I probably have a pretty high risk of something that I'm eating causing a food allergy or I'm intolerant to something I'm eating. I should go out and get a food allergy test. You can sometimes use some of these cheaper tests like a CBC to give you a pretty good idea of whether or not you should order a more expensive test like a food allergy evaluation. And I'll, I'll get into food allergy testing today as well, by the way. So red blood cells, you're going to see a lot of different values. You have your, your meat corpuscular volume, your mean corpuscular hemoglobin, uh, your mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, your red blood cell distribution risk, your mean platelet volume, and your platelet distribution width. I don't have time today to get into every single reference range for each of those values, but what I can tell you is that some of the biggest things you want to pay attention to are your red blood cell count, low being anemia, high being a risk factor for essentially like increased blood clotting or thick blood, you know, erythrocytosis is typically the most common. So for women, 4.2 to 5.4 is a sweet spot for red blood cells. For men, 4.7 to 6.1. For children, 4.1 to 5.5. Uh, 
Those are the main things you want to look at for red blood cells. Make sure that kind of similar to CRP, you haven't done heavy exercise going into a CRP test. You want to make sure going into a red blood cell evaluation or a complete blood count that you're well hydrated because a lot of times if you're dehydrated, that can throw off values, particularly your red blood cell values. So just something to pay attention to. Uh, but complete blood count will tell you a lot, as you can see. And then finally, there's iron. Iron, a lot of times, is uh, it's, it's heralded, I think, probably because of, of the sporting industry and the athletic industry and the prevalence of anemia and a lot of hard charging athletes, particularly endurance athletes, who have a very high red blood cell turnover. The problem is that in the production of ATP by your mitochondria, you produce what are called lipid peroxides. And in many cases, these can result when they interact with iron in the production of hydrogen peroxide, which can essentially act like a rust inside your body. This is a bigger issue in men, uh, in particular, who, who, who don't bleed every month, or in men who, who aren't endurance athletes, who aren't going through a lot of iron. And it's, it's fixable if your iron levels are constantly elevated, or in particular, if something called ferritin is constantly elevated, or GGT, that's gamma glutamyl transferase, this, this is an enzyme that can indicate that you have low iron turnover. If those two numbers, GGT and ferritin, are constantly elevated, and iron is constantly elevated, a lot of times guys just need to give blood a couple of times a year, quarterly, and that fixes the issue. But you do not want your iron constantly elevated, especially if you're a man. Increased risk, look at all these cancer, heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and the problem is that typical reference ranges used by most laboratories for ferritin are 200 to 300 nanograms per milliliter for women and men. Not only is this an issue because they're giving you the same values for two different sexes, but it's also an issue because for lowering the risk of rusting your body from the inside out, you want your ideal levels for adult men and non-menstruating women to be between 30 and 60, and ideally you don't want ferritin to be below 20 or above 80. Kind of like there's a sweet spot for IGF-1 of 80 to 150. There's a sweet spot for ferritin between 20 and 80. And like I mentioned, GGT, which is also an enzyme that you can have measured on a blood panel, that can indicate excess free iron levels as well. If you're a man, you want that below 16 units per liter. If you're a woman, you want that below 9 units per liter. This is a big issue when it comes to heart disease, this issue with iron, and it's becoming more and more... Uh, the, the awareness of the issue with it is, is becoming more and more prevalent. I think more doctors are going to really start paying attention to ferritin, to GGT, and total iron. But it's something that you need to be aware of and that you need to be looking at, especially if you're a man or you're a non-menstruating woman. Okay, so now, appropriately enough before lunch, so you can be all orthorexic about every lot of food that you put into your mouth, we're going to talk about food allergies and food sensitivities and testing for these because this is another question that I get in the realm of self qualification how do I know if I'm allergic to something? You know, let's say my white blood cell counts were constantly elevated and I decided I'm going to get a food allergy test. Do I get the ELISA? Do I get the ALCAP? Well, I don't recommend many food allergy tests because most of them give you a laundry list of false positives, right? Like the, like the 10 different eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper that show all the things you're allergic to. They hang in your refrigerator and you open your refrigerator and there's just like a lonely, forlorn, like, chicken breast and some broccoli, because that's all you can eat now if you got your food allergy test. The problem is that a lot of these food allergy tests are not accurate. They're, they're neglecting to the test for a variety of things, nor are they doing a double test for each protein to make sure it's not a false positive result. So what I use is Cyrex. Some of the reasons I use Cyrex, and I'm not financially affiliated with this lab at all, it's just the one I use on myself and all my clients as the gold standard for food allergy testing. They've got 22 different arrays at Cyrex, but for example, the, the gold standard I use is, is their array 10C. Right? All the arrays are given different numbers. Array 10C tests for gluten cross-reactivity and food reaction to about 180 different antigens, but they test for certain things. So for example, they use a technology that tests for specific protein concentrations for each antigen. Uh, they validate each antigen individually rather than using a reference range to an entire group of different foods. They run, like I mentioned, side-by-side -side duplicates, so they're doing two different tests of each protein. Uh, in many cases, what you'll find is that if you eat food that's cooked above a certain temperature, the antigenicity or the allergic reaction to that protein actually decreases, and a lot of these labs, like using ELISA and ALCAT methods, they're testing your white blood cell reaction 
to the uncooked version of that protein. And so if your results show that you're allergic to eggs, all it means is maybe you produce an immune system response to raw eggs or, or raw chicken, not the cooked version of that. And it's very common people just do fine with the cooked version, but not the raw version. Uh, they test for cross-reactivity. So they'll look at certain things that cross-react with other things in human tissue called pan antigens, like, like a shrimp trochomyosis or food aquaporin. Or a lot of the things you'll find in, as additives to, to soy sauces, condiments, dressings, etc. Um, they look at reactivity to common food combinations. Like they'll tell you, well, you know, you don't have an issue with gluten and you don't have an issue with coffee, but if you consume coffee with your gluten, you get this cross reactivity issue that actually does produce a food allergy reaction. Uh, they look at binding isolates like lectins, which you've probably heard about before, agglutinins. They look at some of these plant defense proteins that other companies don't look at. Uh, they look at artificial food color. So they'll tell you certain type of processed foods that, that you may or may not want to be careful with. They'll tell you if you have issues with red, blue, yellow. With a lot of these food colorings, you probably shouldn't be eating a lot of anyways, but I mean, you, you, you might have a really great multivitamin, but they happen to color their capsule blue, and you're allergic to that, and you don't even know it. So, uh, a few other things they test for are oils, called oleicin, so they're not just testing for proteins, they're testing some oils that have hidden protein in, in them. They're looking at transglutaminase, which is actually used to break down meat. And then they're also looking at combining IgA and IgG on the same test. So essentially, these, these are all reasons why I go with Cyrex for food allergy testing. I also use it for some of the mold and mycotoxin testing I'll tell you about shortly. But it's a really great way to test for food allergies. And if you're going to order food allergy tests, I recommend this one. My only complaint about Cyrex is that you can't yet order this uh, as a test to your own home. It's a blood evaluation that must be ordered by a doctor. But if you have a good doctor, like a functional or integrated medical practitioner, and you tell them, hey, I want to get, let's say, Cyrex Array 10C is a gold standard food allergy test. In many cases, they'll, they'll order that test for you. There are also labs. There's one that I work with called True Health Labs. Uh, Dr. Brady Walsh, and, uh, or Dr. Brian Walsh and Dr. Brady Burst. Uh, if you call them up on the phone, they can order this test for you. And speaking of Dr. Brian Walsh, by the way, for those of you who, who in here is a practitioner, a medical practitioner, or has designs of being a medical practitioner, he has a course, a blood marker and lab interpretation course that is fabulous. It's like some of the stuff I'm teaching you right now, but I mean like a full uh, deep dive into blood measurements and in evaluation of labs. So his, his course is really great too. If you guys dig this stuff and you want to take an even deeper dive. Now the cool thing is you can also use microbiome testing for food allergies. Uh, for example, some of you have probably done a biome test or heard of longevity. I know that, that these guys at the Wild Health Podcast, they just did a podcast with the guys from longevity. Both of these are examples of full microbiome evaluations of the gut. And the cool thing is that certain metabolites produced by the bacteria in your gut can also reflect your propensity to certain food allergies. I'll give you some example. If you have decreased, decreased lactobacilli and increased staphylococcus aureus, that's associated with egg and milk allergies. So if you have a full microbiome analysis, how many of you in here have like biome results or longevity results back home or on your computer? None of you have done like a full microbiome yet? You can learn a lot of cool things. Like sometimes for them to test your microbiome and say, well, you're deficient in such and such a probiotic, therefore you ought to take this probiotic to maintain health. There's not a lot of research behind that stuff, but what you can look at are some of the things I'm showing you right now. You can get some interesting data about inflammation, food allergies, food sensitivity, decreased levels of, of l rhamnosis LKC, l paracase and Bifidobacterium. Those are all accompanied by allergies to cow's milk and egg whites. You can have reduced bacterioids, proteobacteria, and actinobacteria. Those are associated with general food allergies and sensitivities. And in many cases, you don't have an autoimmune reaction, like an IgA, IgE reaction to a food. In cases, or in many cases, it can be your biome, like a bacterial imbalance that's, that's affecting your propensity to produce certain histamines and have certain issues in response to certain foods. A lack of microbiome diversity. If you get your results back and it just says you have a low amount of bacterial diversity. That can increase your propensity to gluten, to FODMAP, and to histamine production. Uh, there are certain species of bacteria that actually can help you with your production of polypeptidases that break down gluten. If you are deficient in those uh, bacteria, sometimes you're not gluten intolerant, you're bacteria deficient. And by replacing or paying attention to these elements of your microbiome, you can fix these issues. You can get back to eating, eating bread, for example, or things with gluten in them. Uh, bacterial overgrowth of the small intestine. 
That's when there's an overall deficit of good bacteria in your gut. That's another thing that you can pay attention to. You risk for something called small intestine bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO. And then histamine intolerance. Let's say you get a headache after you have a glass of red wine, or some kombucha, or some fermented food. This can also be aggravated by an overgrowth of histamine-producing bacteria. And when you look at the results from a microbiome tests like Biome or Longevity, and these are home tests, it's just a very small swab of your stool. Don't be proud of yourself. I have some clients who are so proud that they have managed to shovel a whole heaping teaspoon of stool into the tube, and that messes up the results. Like, pay attention to the, to the instructions when you're hovered over the toilet doing your microbiome analysis. But you can get some very, very good data from your stool that doesn't just indicate like a, like a three-day stool panel. I'll, well, you know, I'll talk about a three-day stool panel in a second here. Well, we'll come back to that because that will test for different things like yeast, mold, fungus. The microbiome test, you're more looking at the absence or presence of certain bacteria, the bacterial diversity, and some amount of inflammatory markers. So that's another one that I recommend that you get. Mold toxicity. Anybody in here familiar with the, the growing prevalence of mold issue in homes, mold and mycotoxin exposure in food? fungus, etc. A lot of these can cause issues with food allergies, and uh, they're, they're brought on by mold and mycotoxin exposure. You essentially develop a hyperactive immune system, and things that you weren't allergic to or sensitive to prior to that exposure, you become allergic or insensitive to. So companies like Quest Diagnostics or LabCorp, they can measure the following, C4A, GTG, GTG beta one MSH, VIP, VEGF, and MMP9. Now, I realize there's a lot of acronyms on it, time to get into all of them, along with leptins, but all of these can actually indicate that your body has been exposed to mold or mycotoxins and you might have some amount of mold toxicity present. It's a huge issue. One of the best books that I can recommend to you that I think you can probably get through, even if you're not a medical practitioner, is by, it's a relatively new book by Dr. Neil Nathan called Toxins. It's a great walkthrough of the issue with mold and mycotoxins and the multimodal approach that's necessary to get rid of the biofilm and to fix the issue for good, because it comes down to a lot more than just, say, taking oil and oregano and, and a full-spectrum probiotic or something like that. Like, these are serious issues that, that take some management. Anyways, though, Cyrex, like I mentioned, they can do a mold and a mycotoxin panel as well. They're array 11 and array 12. If you just want to get mold, mycotoxins, and food allergies all done at once, you get array 10C which is all your cross-reactivity, your antigen production to over 180 different foods, and then you can get Array 11 and Array 12 to look at all these different things like MSH, VIP, and VGF, and you can get a really good picture of whether or not you have mold or mycotoxin issues. And I'm flabbergasted, or, or, or surprised rather, by the number of people I test who have some amount of mold and mycotoxin issues that can and should be addressed. Okay, micronutrients. Most blood panels are going to tell you things like vitamin D, or say, in many cases, RBC magnesium. Vitamin E, vitamin A, sometimes. Vitamin B, you know, you'll usually get B12 and, and some of these other major vitamins covered. But in many cases, if you have low energy levels, poor sleep, chronic fatigue, uh, gas, bloating, poor nutrient absorption, you need what's called a micronutrient evaluation. This is also known more popularly as an organic amino acids evaluation. It tells you a lot about your body. I mean, when I, when I have a client run this, you know, I'm getting like a 20-page report on all the different amino acids, all the different fatty acids, all the different markers of, of fungus and yeast. You can find out a lot about mitochondrial function, gut function, and overall physiology function with a micronutrient analysis. Just think of this as taking an even deeper dive. I don't have everybody do this test, but for people who I coach who just want to get the best of the best or learn everything about their bodies, or for people who I'm seeing issues with that I just can't figure out, a lot of times advise them that they should look into getting a micronutrient panel. So you can see some things they look at, a full vitamin B complex, all your folic acid, vitamin A, E, and D, beta carotene, coenzyme Q10, big one for the mitochondria, all your amino acids, all your fatty acids, all your organic acids, Elements for inflammation and oxidation, like lipid peroxides and homocysteine. These are these are markers that go above and beyond just the HRC, the HSCRP that I talked about. And then compounds with yeast and fungal origins. So you can find out a lot from one of these analyses. Um, the the one that I use is uh, called the Metametrics Ion Panel with 40 amino acids. I know that's a mouthful. I'll put a link to that one in, in the uh, resources page for this presentation. If you go to, what did I say? It was slash Kentucky Castle 19. 
So that, that's a good test to get. They're more expensive. These tests sometimes go in excess of $1,000, and because they're so kind of niche, a lot of times aren't covered by insurance, but you can learn a ton about your body. Even if you just do something like this, you know, once every few years, just to make sure there's no lagging micronutrient issues, there's a lot that you can discover from these micronutrient evals. Okay, gut. I talked about microbiome. What a microbiome test will not look for uh, is the presence of things like yeast, fungus, bacteria, parasites. There's a lot of people who have gut issues who literally have unwanted parasitic critters living in their gut. I'm not necessarily a fan of the idea that, that all parasites are bad. Many of them are not opportunistic. I mean, I've done helminthic therapy with, with tapeworms and whipworms and used some of those to modulate my immune system, particularly when I travel. But in many cases, you know, if you want to look at stuff like C. difficile or H. pylori or some of these other things that can really affect gut function and mood and sleep, you need to get a stool panel that's not one of these full microbiome analyses, but that's one of these panels where you're literally pooping into the equivalent of a hot dog tray for three days in a row, collecting your stool and sending it off to the lab. And within a couple of weeks, you get a PDF to your email inbox that tells you that your shit stinks. <laughs> you, you, have, you have issues going on in your gut. And so in many cases, this can tell you everything from inflammation, undigested food particles, presence of metabolites associated with leaky gut. There's a lot of stuff that this test can tell you. Um, the one that I get, you can see here at the, at the top of these results, called the GI Effects Comprehensive Stool Panel. And I'm a bigger fan, even though it's more expensive, of the three day versus the one day, because your stool will change from day to day. This is kind of nasty to think about, but if parasites are shedding, a lot of times, if you're just getting one glance on one day, it's not going to give you the full picture versus if you spread out the eval over three days. So that's what I like for the gut. Then we have the genes. Like I mentioned, you know, Mike did a pretty good job giving you guys a very good overview of the genes. And uh, did, did you guys record that, by the way, Matt? So, so you know, that'll be available if, if someone is listening and they're not in the room. That's also something that, that, that's probably going to be available on the Wild Health Podcast for you to listen into. But as far as genes go, a few of the things that I think are, are the, the, the cool lower hanging fruit, even though there's tons of stuff you can dig into. Uh, for example, uh, carbohydrate and fat sensitivity, uh, detoxification ability, antioxidant capacity. Muscle fiber composition is a very interesting one. The idea that certain people have higher amounts of fast twitch muscle fiber, certain amounts of people have higher amounts of slow twitch muscle fiber. So some people are power responders versus endurance responders. Uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Andy Galpin, I forget which, uh, which, uh, which university he's at, but he's doing a lot of things with muscle biopsies and figuring out your slow twitch, fast twitch muscle fiber capacity and work with pro athletes and then completely changing their set, rep, loading, velocity schemes just based on their muscle fiber composition. But if you don't want to go in for a painful needle biopsy, you can at least get a decent glimpse into this with a basic genetic analysis. You can see whether or not your, your neurotransmitter production, your COMT genes, are affecting your dopamine and your serotonin metabolism, whether you're a warrior versus a warrior type of a gene. Uh, you can look at your ancestry. I mean, there are wonderful books out there like 100 Years of Food by Dr. Stephen Lee or The Jungle Effect by Dr. Daphne Miller or Return to an Ancestral Diet by Dr. Michael Smith. And these books help you look at, okay, did I come from Sub-Saharan ancestry, Southeast Asian ancestry, Northern European ancestry? What my ancestors eat and how can I structure my diet accordingly based on my epigenetic expression, what foods I'm actually able to digest and do best with because this is what my ancestors ate. So there's a lot to be said for just looking at ancestry just so you can look at the food and the activity and the lifestyle habits of your ancestors. So, you know, we could spend, as, as Mike and Matt know, hours and hours talking about genes. They, they have done that. But a few of the companies that, that, that I use, and my apologies that, that I just had a total <coughs> brain fart elephant in the room, I didn't list uh, Wild Health folks as one of the people who can look at your genes, but you get them tested. Uh, DNA fits a very basic analysis that just gives you a general nutrition and fitness overview of your genetics. Uh, most of these are salivary analysis. You do a salivary swab, you send it into these folks. 23andMe, of course, can test for a limited number of, of single nucleotide polymorphisms, or what are called SNPs, but they can still give you a basic idea. Um, you can also go to the website 23andU.com. 23andU.com has a whole list of different websites that you can upload your raw genetic data results to to take an even deeper dive. 
Uh, just this morning, I had some 23andMe raw results come in from one of my clients. I just wanted to do a quick eval for them. So I uploaded those results to, to a software called Prometheus, which lets me take a deeper dive into the health data that 23andMe won't release. Yes, I'm working with a limited number of steps, but it still gives me a decent idea of some things like, you know, potential for diabetes, celiac disease, etc. Uh, strategy, Dr. Ben Lynch, the author of the excellent book, Dirty Genes, he looks at nine different genetic pathways that are kind of like the lowest hanging fruit. Nitric oxide synthesized pathways, antioxidant and glutathione pathways, sulfuration pathways, and gives you a pretty good report that you can read through on your own that, uh, that, that indicates the biggest dirty genes that your raw genetic data is indicating that you have more or less of a susceptibility to. Uh, genetic Genie is a great website. Uh, another couple companies I've worked with before is uh, Dr. Bob Miller. Uh, he's got Tree of Life. They do a certain type of analyses as well, probably kind of similar to what these guys at, at, uh, at Wild Health are using. And then the DNA company up in Canada, they also do a pretty good analysis as well. And so when I say a pretty good analysis, what I'm saying is they're taking your raw genetic data and they're developing a very specific list of exercise, diet, supplementation, and lifestyle recommendations based on your genetics. I mean, you know, things as simple as, you know, my, my son's back there, you know, hiding under the table, and he has lower levels of, of superoxide dismutase and glutathione production capability based on his genetics. So before school in the morning, he takes a little bit of glutathione. Both of them have the genes responsible for lower levels of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. So they do things like they go in the sauna sometimes, they take lion's mane extract before school, you know, I, I personally have the same gene. I spent a lot of time doing aerobic walking in the sunshine. So there are specific lifestyle parameters that you can change based on what your genes are telling you. Those are just two examples. There are many more that I can get into. And of course, the most important, as you've already learned earlier today, is coffee, right? And I suck down eight cups of coffee afternoon, or can't I? And I'm, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm a fast caffeine oxidizer. I can drink as much coffee as I want. Okay, a couple of others I want to go through. Blood glucose. I mentioned that I wear this Dexcom G6 on the back of my arm. Um, main thing, number one thing I look at with blood glucose is I like my fasted values to generally be below 90. Some people who are eating a low carb, very low carb diet, they tend to have slightly lower amounts of insulin sensitivity just because they're not producing as much and they don't need as much. I don't get as worried if I see someone on a low carb diet with values between about 90 and 100 for their fasting values. But general population, I like to see it between about 80 and 90, but more importantly, what you want to pay attention to is your postprandial blood glucose. So the number that I look for is within two hours after a meal, my levels are less than 120. A lot of doctors will tell you 140, I think that's too high. After a meal, whether you're testing your blood glucose with a finger prick, or whether you're wearing a continuous blood glucose monitor, which if you approach your doctor and you tell them you're concerned about your risk for type 2 diabetes, a lot of times you can get a prescription for them. A lot of times you can get that covered by insurance. It just sends your blood glucose constantly to your phone so you can check in on it at any time. Healthy fasting blood sugar, like I mentioned, 70 to 99. Dexcom G6 is the one that I wear. I was having a conversation with somebody about this a few minutes ago during the break. The nice thing I like about the Dexcom is it's also low EMF for those of you concerned about like constantly having a Bluetooth signal or a Wi-Fi signal on your body. So it tests low for EMF and it gives you a constant data. But the <coughs> number one thing to look for is 70 to 99 for your fasting glucose and especially within two hours after a meal has my blood glucose drop below 120. Ketones are another thing I get a lot of questions about. This is something that I measure. I have a breath ketone monitor in my office. There are also companies now like Keto Mojo that are coming out with very cheap, like less than a dollar versus four dollars a strip, cheap ways to test your blood ketones. A lot of times people will test via urine. The problem is if you're, if you're following a low carbohydrate diet or if you're trying to get into ketosis, the more and more efficient that you do at utilizing ketones, the less and less of this thing called acetoacetate is going to wind up in your urine. And so you'll see less ketones, even though you're in ketosis just fine. So urine isn't a good measurement. Breath is pretty good. They've done a lot of correlative studies that have found that the levels of ketones in your breath, the levels of acetate in your breath, correlate pretty well with the levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate in your bloodstream. So doing a simple breath measurement allows you to not have to test your blood on a frequent basis but it also allows you to get a decent idea whether or not you're in ketosis. And there are companies like Ketonics, 
Keto, that's K-E-Y-T-O, and also Level. Uh, I have, actually, actually I have all three of those, because uh, I just get random shit sent to my house all the time, but, but they can all give you a decent idea of your breath acetone levels and tell you whether or not, you know, red light, green light, yellow light, if you're in, near, or out of ketosis. Gold standard, though, like I mentioned, is blood. If you really, truly want to maintain a state of ketosis, which would indicate that your brain, your liver, your heart, your diaphragm are getting a very stable, slow-burning fuel available to them that's also very good for anti-inflammation, simulates a lot of what we get when we're in a fasted state, increases cellular autophagy. There's a lot of reasons that having a high amount of ketones or being good at utilizing ketones is a good idea. Blood's the gold standard for that, and you can simply do like a blood measurement when you get up in the morning and before you go to bed at night, get a decent idea of your ketones. So ideally, for true metabolic efficiency, ketones believe zero, between 0 0.5 and 3, blood glucose between 70 and 99. You can measure those two values. You're going to learn a lot. Okay, um, HRV and readiness. This is what you want to pay attention to if you have some type of device that can quantify your body. I use an Aura Ring. A lot of people use a wristband called a Whoop. The problem with like a, the average uh, Fitbit, for example, or, or Jawbone is they don't actually dig into your nervous system. They don't tell you what is called your heart rate variability. But what this allows me to do is know at any given point throughout the day how stressed my body is, how prepared my body is to train, how good of a job my sympathetic and my parasympathetic nervous system are doing being coordinated, how toned my vagus nerve is and how well that's innervating the sinoatrial nerve of my heart, meaning cardiovascular function. There's a lot that you can learn from HRV and readiness. So these are all the different values that something like the Aura Ring uses to calculate my readiness score. How good was my sleep the night before? How balanced has my sleep been over the past week? How much activity did I do the day prior? What was the activity balance of that activity based off my activity on other days? What's my body temperature, which is very important, right? A lot of times your readiness will be low when you wake up in the morning because you've had meat sweats all night or the room was too cold. Uh, resting heart rate and especially your recovery index, which is how good a job your heart rate is doing recovering and dropping low after exercise. And then finally, heart rate variability, which is a measurement of the difference in time between each beat of your heart, which indicates good interplay between your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so these are all eight factors that go into calculating a morning HRV or readiness score. You can look at all of these individually. One of the reasons I wear the Aura Ring is because I can just wake up in the morning and I can dig into each of these numbers individually if I want to, but it can also just say your readiness score. Like my readiness score today was at about 80. Not super high, but my sleep score was really high. I got great sleep last night, but it was so high because I took 26,000 steps yesterday. Right, so it, it looked at my step count and said, okay, you had a very high, disproportionately high amount of activity yesterday. You had good sleep, but you should be careful not exercising too much, which is why I'm not wearing my weighted vest right now in my backpack with the kettlebells in it. It's the only reason. Usually I wear that on stage. But you get a really good idea of how your body's doing each day. The other thing is sleep. Sleep can also be measured, and these are the parameters that I look at with sleep. Again, I use the Aura Ring to do this. Total sleep, sleep efficiency, meaning a lot of times you can be laying in bed for nine hours, but you get six and a half hours of sleep, right? That's poor sleep efficiency. Sleep disturbances, how many times do you wake up during the night? REM sleep, which is where a lot of our memory consolidation and learning is gonna occur, and then deep sleep, which is where a lot of nervous system and muscular repair and recovery is gonna occur. We want adequate levels of both. Sleep latency, which is how long it takes you to fall asleep. If your head hits the pillow and you're asleep in three minutes, your sleep latency score is gonna be great. You lay awake with racing thoughts and it takes 37 minutes, your sleep latency is going to be poor. And then sleep timing. How's your sleep architecture based on your circadian rhythm? Are you going to bed at, at 9.30 and getting up at, at say, 5.30 on a regular basis? Or are you 11 one night, 9 another night, 1 a.m. another night? That would indicate poor sleep balance and poor sleep timing. So there's a lot of things to pay attention to that go beyond just, was I in bed for eight hours tonight? Do I wake up and I'm not sore tonight? These are all ways that we can quantify our body, and it's easier and easier to do now in this day and age. So I really don't think there's any reason that, that, that you shouldn't be quantifying things like sleep and HRV. All right, I've got, a, I've got two more slides to show you here. So we're on the home stretch. 
The first is telomeres. A lot of people want to know if you can actually measure the telomeres, the end caps on your DNA, to figure out whether or not your telomeres are shortening at too rapid of a pace. Because generally, you have adequate levels of telomerase, an enzyme in your body that regulates telomere length. Your telomeres are shortening at not too rapid of a pace. This would indicate that attempts you're making to increase your health span, or more specifically your lifespan, your longevity, are actually paying off. Now, telomere testing is a little bit of the wild, wild west right now. A lot of times they're just testing, for example, the telomeres on your on your white blood cells, off single drop of blood. You tend to get results from different labs that come back telling you different telomere lengths. Uh, for a long time, I was pretty hot on using teleyears, but I recently interviewed Dr. Bill Andrews, excellent podcast on all the different things that can help keep your telomeres long. Go, go listen to my podcast with Dr. Bill Andrews if you haven't yet. But he likes repeat diagnostics and life length as the top two ways to measure your telomeres, which you can do on a yearly basis to find out what your biological age is compared to your chronological age. Like maybe you're, you're chronologically 60, but biologically your you're telling your length shows you're 49. Great. Or you should be chronologically 30 and your biological age, and I see this, 60, 70, because you have rampant inflammation, glucose, all these elements that are increasing the rate at which you're telling your short. You can actually test this. And then finally, there's a company called the Cyrus Green. They're not testing your telomere length, but what they actually look at is on a frequent basis, you send in a test of that, and it looks at epigenetic changes in your DNA expression over time. That's also kind of a cool metric that you can use that's very similar to telomere analysis to track your aging, how fast you're aging, or how slow you're aging. And then finally, how the heck do you keep track of all this stuff, right? Like, do you just have like a folder on your computer where you're storing all your lab results? Are there websites where you can upload all of these results to one single platform to be able to look at them? Well, there's a few different ways to go about doing this. Um, the company Heads Up Health is pretty good. That's an online software. I believe they have an app too. You can upload all your lab results, keep track of things like your, you know, your, your Apple Health data, etc. Just put it all into something like Heads Up Health. It'll keep track of a lot of that for you. Uh, Human OS, they are a company that do a lot of good health education. They're in the process of building out metric tracking, lab tracking, self-quantification tracking into their system as well. So if anything, you can just subscribe to their newsletter and kind of find out when that kind of stuff becomes available on their site. Uh, Wellness FX, that's the platform that I've used for a very long time to upload all my lab data or to get tests and then to have it all appear in one single spot, all my blood biomarkers, etc. Longevity is kind of like the up and coming new replacement for Wellness FX, so you can go listen to the podcast or do the podcast that, that Matt and Mike did with longevity or my podcast with longevity, and you can basically learn how they're allowing you to take your gut microbiome, your salivary information, your blood information, etc., and have that all exist on one platform rather than you having all this disparate info spread all over the place. Um, Training Peaks is another one. That's what I use to track a lot of the, the exercise and a lot of the recovery metrics for the clients that I coach. And then finally, Dropbox. Like you can literally have just a single Dropbox folder. And the cool thing is, and this I'll tell you exactly what I do, is all my lab results from any company go directly into a Dropbox folder. I can then upload those to a longevity platform or a wellness FX platform. And then my aura ring data, like my sleep and my HRV and my food data, that just goes straight into my phone on an app. When I'm coaching a client, it's very simple. I have access to their training piece, so I've got all their workout and their exercise information. I have access to their aura ring, so I've got access to all their sleep and HRV information. They, take a, they have a private Instagram account, they share their food logs with me every single day, and then I keep all of their lab information on Dropbox. And that, that allows me to just have everything in just a few different spots and keep track of blood and biomarkers on Dropbox, HRV and sleep on the Aura Ring data, food on the, on Instagram, and exercise on training things, right? So I can, I can juggle four different things. That's generally the same approach that, that I use myself. Well, thanks for listening to today's show. You can grab all the show notes, the resources, pretty much everything that I mentioned over at bengreenfieldfitness.com, along with plenty of other goodies from me, including the highly helpful Ben Recommends page, which is a list of pretty much everything that I've ever recommended for hormones, sleep, digestion, fat loss, performance, and plenty more. 
please also know that all the links, all the promo codes that I mentioned during this and every episode help to make this podcast happen and to generate income that enables me to keep bringing you this content every single week. So when you listen in, be sure to use the links in the show notes, use the promo codes that I generate because that helps to float this thing and keep it coming to you each and every week.